Okay. Hi everyone, welcome to the Navigating the AI with Engineering webinar presented by Optinum Solutions. My name is Kalisha. I have a background in biomedical and electrical engineering. I really enjoy diving into deep engineering and mathematical concepts and seeing how our world is based on these things. My name is Dershan Mikkin. I have a background in mechanical engineering with working experience in the mechanical and mining industry. I'm a solutions engineer at Optinum Solutions, and I enjoy developing innovative solutions that are sustainable. We're excited to chat to you today about how we can close the gap between AI's technology and its adoption, as well as the expansive AI forest and its many constituents. We're also going to talk about how we can merge engineering workflows, as well as the tools to help orchestrate this. Finally, we'll discuss some next steps and present a demo of the tools. Now is a great time to learn about AI because we're at the early stages of what could be a sizable transformation. There is a gap between the hype and excitement around AI and its adoption in industry and the reality of delivering the products to the market. We want to show you that AI can be adopted and integrated into any workflow. This was a survey conducted by Gartner, where about 3,000 companies were asked about their AI adoption. About 50% of them are planning for AI, but only 4% have deployed it. We aim to address the following perceived obstacles in adopting AI. One, that the narrative that integrating AI into existing engineering and scientific workflows is difficult, and the perception of it being challenging to implement AI methodologies and requiring experts to accomplish this. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Desha now to talk about the AI forest. Thank you, Kelly, for sharing those industry insights with us. It's exciting to see the growth in adoption of AI in industry, and I'm looking forward to the creative solutions that come from it in the coming years. So I'm sure most of you have already noticed that we have this AI forest theme going on throughout the presentation. And the reason for this is that it's related to a tech corner post that my colleague Kalisha has developed. If you're interested in the topic, I do encourage you to go and um, give it a read. It's related to AI and navigating the AI forest using Simulink. You can find it on our LinkedIn page, on our website, or alternatively on the bottom right of the slide, which where it's been uh, hyperlinked. So navigating the AI forest. Before we jump into it, let's first define what is AI. AI describes when a machine mimics cognitive functions that humans associate with other human minds, such as learning and problem solving. To my knowledge, AI began in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And when it began, it was essentially developed as a machine's capability to imitate intelligent behavior. But as time progressed and technology began to develop and processes became faster and better, the idea of AI started to morph and evolve into a machine's capability to exceed intelligent behavior. It has become much broader than just the pursuit of true human-like intelligence. AI is achieved by training a machine to learn a desired behavior. The value of this is that humans can perform more high-level tasks or focus on performing certain tasks more safely or efficiently. As engineers, we aim to develop systems that work with as um, little. Sorry, yeah. Um, so let's quickly dive into uh, the three. Uh, before I go ahead and break down the relationships between AI, machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning, let us start at the basics and take a look at the core concepts of programming. When it comes to programming, we can boil it down into three key concepts. Firstly, the data that is used as input into the system. Secondly, the program or algorithms used to process the data and perform tasks. And lastly, the outputs which interact with hardware and provide insights on the input data dependent on the program that you develop. Using these three core concepts, let us take a look at how programming has evolved into machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning over the years. So, Starting with traditional program. In traditional programming, you begin with some sort of data and a program that you developed to produce outputs which interact with hardware or produce insights about your input data. An example of traditional programming would be performing a calculation. 
So, how does machine learning use these three core concepts different to traditional programming? Well, in machine learning, uh, here we take input data and the outputs, or essentially the solutions or classifications for the input data, and we use it to teach a machine learning algorithm to pre uh, perform statistical analysis, such as clustering, classification, or regression. And it learns to come up with some sort of accurate prediction. The output of the workflow is an algorithm or program that will be able to accurately predict an output when given new but similar data. The training component of machine learning means the model tries to optimize along a certain dimension. In other words, the, the machine learning model tries to minimize the error between the predictions and the actual ground truth values. But this is a very high level overview of machine um, learning. So let us break it down into a little bit more detail. Machine learning can be broken down into four steps. The first is data processing. This step could vary depending on the type of data that you're working with, and it can range from anything such as image resizing to converting audio signals into a spectrogram. The second step in this process is feature extraction, and in machine learning, this is manual feature extraction. So what do I mean by that? This is in this step, a person would have to manually sort through the data and label key features which the machine learning algorithm can use to learn against. So if I had to give you an example, if we were developing a machine learning algorithm to be able to take in um, inputs such as images and it needed to classify whether the image contained um, a car in it or not, what we would have to do in this step is we'd have to take some of the input data and we'd have to manually sort through the data and label key points of a car that we believe are important in, image, uh, in, in the machine learning algorithm's classification. So that could be essentially going through the data and labeling that this is a headlight, this is a tire, this is a windshield, and so forth. And that leads us on to our third step. The third step is the, the third step is the machine learning algorithm. In this step, the algorithm will train on your labeled input data using statistical algorithms. And lastly, what you get out of the process is a machine learning model or algorithm that you can pass new but similar data into and it will make some predictions on it. The key concept of machine learning is its ability to learn. During training, it attempts to learn which of the extractive, extracted features holds more importance than others and how to minimize errors in its prediction. Machine learning um, is a subset of AI. So let's take a look at how deep learning um, differs from machine learning. So, Instantly, you should be able to recognize that there's a step that has been removed, and that is feature extraction. In deep learning, feature extraction is integrated within the training and is represented by the first few layers of the neural network. Hence, you simply need to supply the algorithm with your data and it attempts to understand the extracted features that it believes is important. And then it follows a similar workflow to machine learning. It uses the last few layers of the neural network for classification. At the end of the process, you end, up with a, uh, you end up with a deep learning model or algorithm that you can pass new but similar data into, and it will be able to perfor uh, perform some sort of predictions on it. Deep learning is an advancement and therefore a subset of machine learning. So now let's take a look at reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, uh, RL is a form of learning that is based on, train, um, on a trial and error. There is an agent, which is a thing you're trying to improve, and an environment, which is something that you want to control. Your agent is generally a control system, and the environment is gener generally um, a model of your physical plant. This could be, for example, a pump or a production line or so forth. So, how, machine, uh, how reinforcement learning works is that the agent will pass an action to the environment. This could be, for example, a manipulation of variables. Then the environment will react to these new inputs and it will pass an observation back onto the agent to let it know how its action has impacted the environment. If the actions made a positive change to the environment, then the environment will also pass back a reward to the agent, letting it know that its actions had an positive impact 
or consequence on the environment. This process is repeated with the agent making small changes to its actions and improving over time. So let's take a look at a basic example of how we can ap apply reinforcement learning. What you're seeing on the screen may look familiar to some of you. It's essentially a basic block diagram that, controls, uh, that contains a controller, which is, for example, a PID controller or a PI controller or so forth, and a system, which is essentially a physical mod a model of your physical plant and a feedback loop. Uh, on the left, you have an APC, which stands for an advanced process control. And what it does is it takes in observations and inputs from sensors, for example, and it determines a set point that is passed into the controller or into the feedback loop, actually. So where can we apply reinforcement learning to this, um, to this block diagram? Well, the first place that you can apply it is to the APC. And applying it here will mean that the agent will take in observations from the system and the environment and it will try and optimize the set point that is being passed into the feedback loop. Alternatively, you could apply it to the controller. Applying it to the controller would mean that the reinforcement learning agent manipulates the P, I, and D gain values to better control the system, taking in the error that is received from the feedback loop and making adjustments based on that. So let's quickly summarize uh, what I've discussed. So AI was initially the starting point, and it focuses on the statement of I imitate. But as time progressed and technology got better, um, AI progressed into machine learning, and that focuses on the statement I learn. And what, are, what do I mean by that? Well, essentially, machine learning has to take in all the features that you extracted, and it needs to learn and try and understand which features would, uh, have a, would better contribute into uh, producing more accurate predictions. Then you have deep learning and reinforcement learning, and they focus on I learn to learn. And what, is, what do I mean by that? Well, firstly, it learns in the same sense as machine learning in, for example, providing uh, more accurate uh, predictions. But not only does it have to do that, it also has to be able to take in the data and perform um, automatic feature extraction. So essentially, it has to take in the data, look at the data and understand it, and try and make um, judgments on, on as to what features would be uh, important in, um, in the classification. And lastly, we have the distributed agents and swarm deep reinforcement learning, and they focus on the statement I contribute. So now you've gone through the process and you've created a machine learning or deep learning uh, algorithm or model, and you now implement it into your workflow and starts to contribute. And the whole point of the process is to be able to allow it to contribute to your workflow so that you can focus on more higher level tasks that revolve around, for example, safety and efficiency. And lastly, to summarize the relationships between the four different types of learning, we have AI, which is the superset, machine learning, which is an evolve, uh, which evolved from AI and is therefore a subset of AI, and then deep learning and reinforcement learning, which are advancements of machine learning and are therefore subsets of that. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Kalisha, who is going to uh, explain merging workflows. Thank you for those insights into the AI workflows, Deshan. Let's talk about merging engineering and scientific workflows with AI methods and the tools to orchestrate it. So we're going to be using these symbols in the next few slides to address how AI, engineering, and Simulink workflows integrate and how they mingle. Dushin discussed the components you need for your AI-based system. You've got your data, your desired output, and your model. Does that mean you're ready to go? Are you done? And the answer is no, you're not done, you're not complete. And this addresses why there is a gap between the promise of AI and the reality of its adoption. There are things that are missing. Let's consider a specific example to demonstrate what's missing, being automatic lane detection and lane keeping a system. I know this slide looks quite busy, but block diagrams are always exciting and accessible to me, and I'm sure you can relate to that. So the system produces some form of data, whether that be in the form of cameras, radar, or other sensors mounted onto the vehicle that are all collecting data about the environment. 
Then that data is processed and analyzed with image processing, for example, to figure out where the lanes are. You may need to do some pre-processing too if there is noise in the data from things like rain or other weather conditions. And now hopefully you've cleaned your data to an appropriate level of preparation to build your model. Now you can start building that model and designing your AI generated control strategies to enable the braking autonomy. You can now start predicting factors about the environment, like the speed of adjacent vehicles or what their behavior may look like. Okay, but you're still not done, because for this to work, you have to infuse your algorithm with the vehicle's embedded and complex system. So you have to get the intelligence of your AI algorithm to talk to the actuators of the car to invoke some sort of controlled braking, steering, and so forth. That is everything required to deliver a relatively straightforward capability. Okay, so what is missing? Why is there a gap again? Well, what's missing is everything else that goes into the whole engineering design workflow. And this is the generic engineering workflow and capabilities that we use every day as engineers and scientists. And this is what we have so far, just one piece of the puzzle, just one piece of the overall model development. On a daily basis, we access data. Sometimes that's in the form of sensors, flat files, real-time systems, databases, and so forth. We do some pre-processing, often using domain-specific knowledge. Then we develop AI models and other useful algorithms. And in addition to algorithmic and predictive work, there is also modeling and simulation. And finally, you're still not done because you have to deploy the system to people to make it useful. This could be deployed in an app, a desktop computer running in the enterprise systems at your organization for your external customers or embedded devices for cars and planes. I'm not sure if anybody here is familiar with CAFE and TensorFlow. These are powerful and well-known open source frameworks for deep learning and machine learning. Generating AI models is the focus of these dedicated tools. MathWorks supports AI model development with, it, with its own tools and using ones like these. Simply put, MathWorks integrates AI into the complete workflow for developing a fully engineered system. The ultimate goal of this is for AI to be another tool in your kit, to solve problems in a different way or to tackle new ones. So the purpose and the vision is to make your workflow simple. We want to interoperate with these open source frameworks through the Onyx standard to bring models in and to get models out. So you use the best tools for the job and also the tools that you use, especially the MathWorks ones, are easy to use and they don't interfere with you getting your job done. Ultimately, we don't want to interrupt your workflow and that is the purpose of the software. And that is also how you close the gap. Considering the familiar data components of the previous workflow, we can see how this can also be AI based. And then you have one AI system feeding into another AI system. So we'll discuss an example of this, likely applicable to many client stories who need to label lots of data and doing so manually is error prone and inefficient. The basic premise is to classify one part of your data and automatically run an algorithm for the rest of the data to label and classify based on a training set. The benefits of this include speeding up your training, reducing errors, and making your progress faster. Let's consider, la let's consider labeling radar signals with the Signal Labeler app, where you can label main time and frequency features of a pulse radar signal. Here you create a more complete and accurate data set to train your models on. You can identify waveform type, measure pulse repetition frequency, pulse width, duty cycle, and pulse bandwidth. There are dashboards too that help you keep track of the labeling progress, correct mistakes, and evaluate the label's quality. So we want to build AI functionality into our Simulink models. Typically, a Simulink model comprises of algorithms under development, and the physical environment. The use cases for integrating trained AI models into Simulink include AI for algorithms that will eventually be deployed and data-driven environment modeling. Building a successful AI integrated system requires navigation of the entire workflow and focusing on more than just modeling and training an AI model. Data is the center of most AI applications, so data preparation is an essential ingredient in the AI workflow, 
and the quality of your AI model is limited to the quality of your data. Data preparation goes beyond more than just having lots of data and pre-processing it. It includes collecting data from the field. That includes the case you want to detect and identify, and you also need to pre-process that data and extract relevant features, like in the previous signal statistics example that we looked at. Ultimately, it's about human insights and deciding if you should augment data sets with synthetic data and more sampling and getting clean data faster by automating your labeling process. Proceeding into the development phase of the workflow, we consider modeling. Here you choose your algorithms. Are you using machine learning, deep learning, or a combination? As we saw earlier, you have the capability of starting with a complete set of algorithms and pre-built models. So you can take advantage of the broader work of the AI community, and you don't need to start from scratch. You then have more time to crudely and finely tune your model to identify an optimal set of parameters and get a robust and accurate model out. Here we can note that accuracy and speed to train are influenced by hardware with a combination of parameters and input data. For example, modeling and training could yield a classification model for mechanical or electrical failure predictions in a system. This phase further envelopes simulation and testing, where you can simulate trained AI models as part of a larger system to ensure it works as expected. For example, a Simulink model functioning as a digital twin that tests trained machine learning models in different failure scenarios before putting it into production. Ultimately, AI must coexist with all other pieces fluidly to ensure the results and the behavior are expected in every situation. Simulation effectively allows you to test edge cases and verify a lot of scenarios that would typically be too time intensive to evaluate. So you don't need to worry about deriving complex mathematical models, which may not even be possible. And you can test each component individually, but also make sure they all play nicely together and validate the system before deploying. Finally, you're ready to deploy your system. This almost always goes back to data preparation because of the iterative nature of the design workflow. A wide range of AI applications means there's a wide range of deployment requirements. Since you can integrate AI into many systems, you need the system developed to have the flexibility to be deployed to all possible platforms. For example, ECUs in the automotive field, edge systems in chemical plants, enterprise systems in manufacturing, or cloud-based streaming systems to collect data from multiple places. So let's put our money where our mouth is and demonstrate these capabilities and integrated workflows with an example. Since I'm a biomed, I found the application of Mama Oops initiative to be particularly interesting. Pneumonia is the leading cause of death for children younger than five worldwide. This is mostly attributed to misdiagnosis, which is particularly prevalent in remote areas with limited medical equipment and doctors. A few engineers in Uganda decided to tackle this medical problem with an engineering solution, which required turning the symptoms into data. They monitored a few major vital signs, being temperature and breathing rates, which are relatively straightforward to measure. The real challenge came in with quantifying lung sounds, so they designed a wearable medical jacket known as the Mama Op. This is a microphone laden jacket serving as a wearable stethoscope to listen for pneumonia's distinctive and characteristic wheezing and crackling lung sounds. They then collected clinical data and labeled the data with the help of medical professionals. The data set included normal lung sounds and known cases of pneumonia. Finally, signal analysis techniques were used to find and identify features of the crackling sound. Using the features from the extracted data, they were able to train a classifier with interactive MathWorks machine learning classification tools. The jacket then connects to a phone app via Bluetooth to record and analyze results. This is then accessible by a medical professional to make an informed diagnosis without requiring an in-person examination of the child. What an elegant marriage of the medical and engineering walls that effectively demonstrates how the AI workflow integrates with numerous fields fluidly. I really hope that we've proven to you that AI can be adopted and integrated into any workflow. There is little difficulty in integrating these workflows and the implementation of AI methodologies does not require experts. You can code your own data scientist. And that's how we close the gap. So what are some next steps? Well, you could watch and perform and do the on-ramp for MATLAB, the on-ramp for Simulink, the on-ramps for state flow, deep learning, and for machine learning. 
I'm going to hand over to my colleague Dasha now, who's going to go through a really cool demo with you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that. Uh, so now let's put this into practice. Let me show you a demo where we are going to apply reinforcement learning. OK, so let's take a look at this demo. What you're looking at right now is something called a MATLAB live script. And it's something that's very similar to, for example, your live scripts in Jupyter. If any of you are familiar or uh, familiar in uh, coding in Python and Anaconda. And essentially what it is, is that it is a, uh, well, a live script is basically a combination of both text, images, uh, equations, and code. And it's displayed within a, in a format that's very similar to reading a report. So you'll be able to read your text, um, read your code, see what the outputs of your code were, um, and essentially it reads like a report. And not only that, you are, you're able to export this into a, uh, into a report in a number of different formats, for example, PDF, Word, HTML, and LaTeX. Okay, so what are we gonna do today? We're gonna use a reinforcement learning agent to control the scheduling of a water distribution system. So taking a look at this figure, uh, let's explain what is happening. We are trying to control the water that is being um, basically supplied to a community. And the water that's being supplied to a community is deemed by this, um, this variable Q demand. Uh, this is a holding tank, which is holding the water for the community, and it is being supplied by water from a larger reservoir, and the, the, the amount of water being supplied by the tank is deemed by the variable Q supply. Okay, uh, the water that is being pumped into the um, tank or being fed by the re reservoir is being controlled by three different pumps that can be switched on and off. So what is the objective of this reinforcement learning agent? Well, it has two objectives. The first one is to ensure that the amount of water in the tank doesn't drop too low so that we can always meet demand. And it also, uh, and to ensure that it doesn't go too high where we're gonna overflow the tank. The second objective for this reinforcement learning agent is to control the number of pumps that are operating at any given time in order to minimize the energy usage and therefore minimize the number of pumps operating. So to optimize it essentially. So let's take a look at some of the equations that we're going to use to, um, to model the system and the agent. Well, the first one, uh, the first important equation that we're going to look at is this Q supply, and that is the water being supplied by the reservoir into the tank. Let me also just zoom in so it's easier to read. There we go. So as we can see, Q supply is a function of time, but it's also a function of a variable called A. And the variable A is, our, is going to be our action by a reinforcement learning agent, and it's the number of pumps that are operating at any given time. So when zero pumps are operating, of course, no water will be supplied to the, uh, to the tank. When a single pump is operating, we are going to be supplying water to the tank at a rate of 164 centimeters per hour. Then when there's two pumps operating, it's at 279 centimeters per hour and so forth. The second important equation that we need to look at is the uh, rewards function that the agent is going to use to understand whether or not it's doing a good job. So this rewards function can be broken down into three different terms. Starting with the final term, uh, we can see that it's um, essentially subtracting A. One thing I should mention with regards to this reward function is that the output is going to be a negative number. The more negative the number means the agent is performing poorly and the closer that number is to zero, the better the agent is performing. So one of the objectives that we mentioned is that we're trying to minimize the energy usage by the pumps. And that makes sense then that uh, we have this term in the rewards function, because the more pumps that we are operating at a given time, the greater the penalty that is um, imposed on the rewards function. And that makes sense because we want to use fewer pumps at any given time to minimize energy usage. Let's take a look at the second term in the equation. OK, so what we have here is a penalty of negative 10, and that is applied when the level of water in the tank is less than or equal to 0.1 meters. And what's the reason for that? Well, if we if the water level in the tank gets too low, we run the risk of not being able to meet demand. 
and that's a bad thing. So we do need to penalize it if it gets too low. And now the first, uh, let's look at the first expression, uh, the first term in this expression. So again, we get penalty of negative 10, but the, this penalty is applied whenever the uh, level of water in the tank exceeds um, a certain level, which is going to be H max minus 0.1 meters. And the reason for that is this term is saying that if the water, uh, if the water level in the tank gets too high, we run the risk of um, overflowing the tank and wasting water, and we need to be penalized for it. Okay, so now let's get into the example. The first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to uh, generate a water demand profile for the um, for the community that is requiring water. And in order to do that, we're going to use this generate water demand function. And this is a user defined function that can be found at the end of the code. Uh, the inputs to this function is the number of days that we're trying to generate uh, this water demand profile for. And uh, we've set that to four days. So let's go ahead and run this and we're going to plot it in the window below. So it's just running. And there we go. This is your water demand function that we just plotted. And as you can see, the axis in the bottom is in hours. So four days equates to 96 hours, which is um, correct. And this water demand is pretty accurate to what we would expect. Uh, we have a spike in the morning. Uh, well, we have two spikes per day. So one in the morning when people wake up are trying to get ready for work and so forth. And one in the evening or afternoon when they get home from work, they want to shower or wash dishes and so forth. Then in the middle of the day, we have a moderate, a moderate water demand. And that makes sense because people are either working from home and using water or they are, for example, running businesses that require water. And then again, in the early hours of the evening, we have an extremely low water demand, which makes sense because generally most people are sleeping at that time. And we have four cycles of this for the four days. OK. Next, we're going to open up and we're going to use Simulink to connect this reinforcement learning agent um, and train it. So let's go ahead and open the model. And it's opened up on my other screen over here. OK. So. Let's take a look at this model and see what it's doing. Well, firstly, um, let's take a look at the reinforcement learning agent. And the reinforcement learning agent is essentially encompassed by this block, this RL agent block. If we go ahead and open that, we'll see that we are passing in an agent. This is the agent that we're going to create and train later on in the demo, but we're passing in an agent as a variable. Um, and in parallel to that, we, are, we have a control law. So if we go ahead and open that, this is just a general bang bang control law that most people use when trying to determine the water level in a tank and operating certain pumps. Essentially, all it is is that if you have float, uh, float switches or level switches in your tank, you can generate, you can tell roughly the, the water, the, the level of water in the tank. And from there, you can determine if you want to use one, two or three pumps. OK. So that's our control law, our basic control law and our reinforcement learning agent. So coming out of the reinforcement learning agent, we have our action, which if we follow the block diagram into our water tank system, we can see that it's being input into the water tank system as A, which is the number of pumps um, that are operating at a given time. So if we go ahead and open our water tank subsystem, let's take a look at what we see. So we have the uh, number of pumps being input into the system, and we have some water curves that tell us how much water is going to be supplied to the tank, dependent on how many pumps are operating. We then subtract that from the water that's being uh, required or demanded by the community. And if we integrate that over some sort of time, we'll be able to determine the level of water in the tank. And that is being output from the system as an observation. So if we follow that, um, output in our block diagram, we can see that it is being passed as an observation to the agent and also to the reinforcement, um, sorry, to the rewards function along with the action that was taken, which is the number of pumps that are operating. The rewards function then calculates a reward based on the observation and action, and it passes that to the reinforcement learning agent so that it can understand how it's performing. Cool. 
So let's go back to the live script and let's see what, um, let's start creating the agent. So the first thing we need to do is just specify some initial conditions, for example, the level of water in the tank, uh, our tank properties and so forth. The next thing that you need to do is you need to create an environment interface between the reinforcement learning agent and the Simulink model. In order to do that, you have to specify the actor's um, information or the actions that it can take. So that would be where they can turn on one, two or three pumps. And you need to specify the types of observations that it can receive. Now we are specifying two variables since uh, this is going to be a continuous time signal. So the first variable is your time. The second one is the level of water in the tank. In order to create the environment interface, we use this function RL Simulink environment and we pass in the required information. OK. Next, we're going to go ahead and create a DQN agent. Now, this is a type of reinforcement learning agent, and essentially it uses an actor critique policy where the critique um, tries to maximize the long term or firstly it tries to estimate what the long term reward is going to be and it tries to maximize that. So in order to do that, we are going to create a, a non recurrent neural network. Now, there are several ways that you can do this within MATLAB and Simulink and the first way is to specify a layers um, variable and actually type in encode all the layers that you require. OK. The alternative way, and this is something that's pretty useful for uh, newcomers into the space, and it's a visual approach to doing this, and essentially it's using MATLAB apps. So within MATLAB, we have an app called the Deep Network Designer. So if we go ahead and we open this app, we're just going to have to give it a little bit of time to open up. Uh, essentially, this is an app that allows you to visually create uh, neural networks, and it also has some cool and nifty features to analyze the network, and um, you can see if there's going to be runtime errors or any other sort of errors. So I'm just waiting for it to still open. Give it a moment. It's loading. There we go. It's opened on my secondary screen. I'm just going to bring that up. Okay, so this is the Deep Network Designer. And when you open this app, you are greeted with a starting page. And in the starting page, um, there is already some pre-trained networks that you can use, uh, so it can speed up development like that. Most of these, I believe, are for image classification, but they are uh, ones for text and audio such as these. So let's go ahead and open one just to see what it looks like. So just like Simulink, you have blocks and connections. It looks like a block diagram. You can move things around. You can throw in new blocks. You can connect blocks um, and so forth. So I'm just going to we turn this back to its original state. We can auto arrange that. OK, these are the different layers in this network. And one of the nifty features that I mentioned already is you can analyze the network. So once you've gone ahead and you've created your neural network, you can go um, within this app. You can analyze it for any sort of errors, uh, connection errors, runtime errors and so forth. And it'll generate a report like this that will give you if there are any errors, it'll tell you where the errors are, and sometimes it gives you a suggestion of how to fix them. OK, so we're not going to go ahead and use this today. Uh, we have gone ahead and we have created our own using code. OK, so we create our non recurrent neural network. And we create our critique using that, passing in some critique options such as learn rate, um, in gradient threshold, along with the reinforcement neural network and we create the critique. Now, in order to create the agent, what you need to do is you need to pass in the critique that we just created along with some uh, of the agent options. So we've gone ahead and we have specified some of the agent options over here. And to create the agent, we just use this function, RL DQNA, uh, DQN agent, and we pass in the critique and the options. OK. The next step in the process is to train the agent. Now, when it comes to training the agent, you need to first specify some training options. So, for example, the max episodes, 
uh, plots, etc. And uh, one of the cool things that you can do with this in this step is you can speed up training by either using a GPU and CPU. And with MATLAB, it's pretty simple to do by just adding an extra line of code over here to specify if you'd like to use your CPU, your GPU, or combination of both. Okay. Um, for this example, uh, we're not going to actually train the model. The reason for this is that in order to do this, it will take several minutes uh, or several hours to train. So we're just going to use a pre-trained network and we're going to load it in. And our pre-trained network is going to be a Simulink water distribution DQN.mat file. Okay. But if you went ahead and you did train it, what you would see is this installation manager will come up uh, during the training process and it will visually show you how the agent is performing over time. So it'll plot this graph as time goes and you can see how it performs. So as we can see, the agent started performing pretty poorly because it's a very negative number. And as time went on, the agent started to um, increase its or actually decrease its reward and perform better. And it kind of stabilized around the negative 50 reward mark. Okay. Um, this installation manager also provides some important information to you, uh, such as the number of episodes run, uh, your hardware resources that were used, how long it took to, to train this network, and so forth. Okay. So now, once we have the agent, we, we're going to go ahead and we're going to simulate the DQN agent, and we're going to also simulate the baseline uh, bang bang control that I showed you in the simulink model and we're going to see how they perform against each other. In order to simulate it in simulink all you need to do is you need to pass in the necessary um, the necessary items such as the agent the environment and so forth and use this sim function to simulate it in simulink. Again we do the same with the baseline controller okay but now instead of uh, passing in the agent we're going to pass in the baseline controller. Okay, and essentially what we did is we just changed the manual switch in our simulink model. So we would have just alternated this using code. Okay. And lastly, let us compare the results. So when we're comparing the results, we ran the two, um, the baseline controller and the DQN agent for 30 simulations each. And we plotted the results for the reward on this graph. So Taking a look at it, we can see that the baseline, um, the baseline controller performed very erratically. Its uh, reward function could uh, vary anywhere from negative 90 to negative 80. And it, we can also notice that the uh, rewards function is considerably lower compared to your DQN agent. So your DQN agent not only performed more consistently, but it performed, at a, um, it performed much better than the baseline model in terms of um, minimizing um, energy consumption and ensuring that it was able to supply the community with the required demand. And it had an average um, what's it, reward of negative 40. And that brings us to the end of the demo. So I'd like to just say thank you very much for attending this webinar or watching it. Um, and we'd love to hear your questions. If you aren't watching this live, please go ahead and reach out to us at support at optimum.co.za. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks everyone.